Vietnam. Welcome to <laughs> Vietnam. And everybody was thinking we're going to say something. Uh, no, 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 we're, we're not, not saying that. We're not saying that. Okay. Saying that. Hey, um, Vietnam. Welcome, everyone, uh, to um, uh, uh, Vietnam Tourism Voices. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, uh, we've got some fantastic panelists here. We are going to, uh, we have uh, Ken Atkinson. Ken Atkinson, who is the founder of Grant Thornton Vietnam. We've got Lynn Lay. Lynn, Lynn is the principal and co-founder of Luxperia. We've got Lynn Bui. Lynn Bui is the MD of Sense Asia Travel. We have Jai uh, Kisnan, who is the general manager of New World Phu Quoc Resort. And we have Seif Hamdi, who is the general manager of the Intercontinental Da Nang Sun Peninsula Resort. Um, and of course, we have yourself, Mr. Barnett. Well, he will be doing um, something on the sandbox. So where are we? On oh, the sandbox. Actually, if I'm going to come to the sandbox, I've got to get ready for the sandbox. I've got to I'm take a swim for the sandbox. Oh, okay, so Good day. We have our, thanks very much, Bill. Okay. We've got a little bit of experience um, with the sandbox. Um, so, so everybody's asking about the sandbox because right now, the only place to take, the only leisure destination open between Hawaii and the Maldives, which has international travelers, is Phuket. And I think Vietnam is also now talking about the opening of Phu Quoc and the, basically this test case of proof of concept. And where we said there's a lot of debate about the sandbox, but let me say after the first two months of the sandbox, we had 26,000 international travelers arrive at the Phuket sandbox, okay? We had $50 million in revenue, which was attributed to that. So when we look at the success or failure of the sandbox, it was a first step in a journey, okay? I think something we always understand about the Sandbox Initiative, it's about travel, okay? Now, travelers spend money in hotels. They're not necessarily all tourists and everything else. The Sandbox has not been a way to fully restore tourism, but it's taught people how to travel again. I go back to what happened after 9-11. We had to learn to take our shoes off in airports and to travel internationally under different procedures, and that's what we're learning today. And so this is really a proof of concept. So today when we say what is the sandbox and why is it relevant to Vietnam, it's where do you start? Yeah. You know, how, yeah, yeah. What's, what's the proof of concept? Starting, starting, it's a great starting place to open up the country. Exactly. Yeah, and that's working here. Right, um, first up, we have uh, Ken Atkinson. Ken is, um, uh, going, is, well, Ken is the founder of Grant Thornton Vietnam, yeah. and, uh, and Ken has some, some words for us. I'm going to leave you with Ken. Well, the godfather of Vietnam, uh, <laughs> Vietnam entrepreneurship. Like. Ken's been there longer than I can remember. Ken? Over hey, Ken. To, how over are you? to you, Ken. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I, I always remember uh, when you took your first position up in Way, um, <laughs> coming up to visit you. Um, but uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a brief presentation. I'm going to start with uh, just an overview and remind ourselves what it was like pre-COVID um, and then move into a plan for, uh, for reopening our, our international borders. Um, so if we remember, um, we were getting 18 million uh, foreign visitors back in 2019 and we had 85 million domestic, domestic um, tourists. And total revenue from the industry was about 36 billion US, um, two thirds attributed to international and one third attributed to, uh, to domestic. The market since April, um, and, and we did have some pretty stellar figures in January and February um, from April 20 uh, has been totally, totally domestic apart from uh, some quarantine, uh, quarantine visitors. Um, 2020, uh, we actually still had 50 million uh, domestic travelers, but revenues, tourism revenues fell approximately 80, 80 percent. Um, and since September 20, uh, fewer people have been willing to uh, to risk to risk air travel. And uh, it's clear, I think, to to most uh, that tourism is not sustainable, relying only on on domestic on domestic travel. Um, there is a plan for reopening, which has been supported by both the central government um, and certainly the general secretary of, of King Yang province, um, as Vietnam is changing direction to a policy uh, from a policy of no COVID uh, to live with COVID. And the first step in that direction, um, it, it will be a pilot project um, in Phu Quoc, 
And hopefully that pilot will lead to further pilots in gradually reopening other, other resort areas. Um, sorry. So just uh, a little bit of information on, on Fuquoc, and you'll get all these, all these slides and numbers, I'm afraid we, we were having problems with sound uh, and bandwidth. So um, you'll get all these numbers circulated afterwards. But there's about 20,000 hotel rooms operational in, in Fuquoc, or, or these were the numbers pre-COVID, uh, with a pipeline of an additional 30, uh, 15,000, so a total of 35,000 hotel rooms, um, which, well, is, is more than Sydney, so you can make your own evaluation of, of supply demand. Um, in 2019, Fukok had uh, 5 million visitors to the, to the island, um, 4.5 million were uh, domestic, um, and half a million were international, international travellers. So what are what are the real challenges to to reopening? Uh, and and when we're talking about a pilot, uh, the pilot is so we can learn. Um, the pilot is so we can test the uh, the regulations and and procedures that are being put in place to uh, to keep people generally safe. Um, and we're also adopting a policy of learning learning from others. So the lessons from uh, from Phuket will be uh, will also be very important. But the uh, vaccinations, of course, I think everybody has realised now is, is one of the, at least one of the keys to safer reopening. Um, and the plan is that everybody in Phuket will be vaccinated uh, with two vaccinations before uh, the opening. And because of a recent outbreak. Uh, that opening of Fuquoc has been put back from November the first um, to uh, to December December the twentieth. Um, the plan for reopening, uh, the, uh, the various stakeholders committed to uh, to have that plan submitted to the government by by the end of September, um, and I believe that is is well in process. As a member of the Tourism Advisory Board, uh, I run the policy working group. We have recommended that the, the ministry um, put in place uh, put in place a task force um, with the main key ministries involved and also key stakeholders from the from the private sector, including the participation of some of the the, the larger the larger hotel groups. Um, some of the questions that uh, need to be addressed and, and answered is, you know, the technology platforms, uh, particularly for the vaccination certificates. Um, Vietnam Airlines and the other local airlines seem to have, do uh, have adopted the IATA pass. So the challenge is that uh, we need to adopt that as a country um, and we need to, uh, the, um, the Ministry of Health needs to, uh, make their database platform um, able to link with the IATA platform. And uh, I think that's the key. We've got, we've got a green pass in, in Vietnam now, um, which is basically a QR code. And uh, that, uh, that seems to work reasonably well. Uh, and I think it's um, obviously it's a little bit work in progress. Uh, but I've certainly got mine, uh, and uh, although I had a vaccination missing, um, it was put in. It was corrected within about within about five days. Um, I think the main one of the main target markets for Fuquat once they've reopened is is going to be looking at charter flights um, from India, um, trying to capture some of the the Indian wedding business. Um, Question: Will visa-free visa exemption continue in place? Um, and the recommendations are, of course, that not only do we leave Food Quokka's visa-free as it is now, uh, but we also expand the visa exemption so that we are competitive with with other regional um, countries. And then I think one of the, the, the bigger challenges is, is making sure that we have not only the facilities to, to deal with COVID outbreaks, um, 
but also the qualified medical staff and, and uh, equipment to go with that to, uh, to contain any outbreak and, and, and also keep people, keep people alive. Um, that's all um, from me. And uh, in the slide deck, you'll see some information about Grant Thornton um, for those of you who, who don't know the organization. So I'll pass back now to, uh, to David and Bill. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Ken. And anybody who wants to see, Ken actually has a great presentation. We wanted, you know, we wanted you to watch Ken's face and everything else today, so we'll be sending Ken's presentation to you after the, pres after the event as well. So everybody's going to be receiving Ken's a great presentation today. David, what's next? Thank you. I, um, actually, I've got a question for Ken. Okay. Ken, I've got a question for you, because something we've learned from Phuket is we all expected, you know, after 18 months of, the, of this whole pandemic, we, we first thought, if we go back to last year, we thought the Chinese would be the first market in. That didn't happen. So, we, you know, we've been pivoting all the time, saying, what's the next market's going to be as well? But one thing you forget about is that it's not a matter of the restrictions of where they're coming from. It matters what happens when those travelers go back. So when you look at those likely countries, Ken, it's not the situation of, can they get into Vietnam, but what happens when they go back to their own countries? Yeah. Which countries are those likely to have airlift and to have those lower restrictions from? Well, I think there's been diplomatic discussions with with India, so I, I, I'm I'm uh, comfortable that those exemptions or or returning with no quarantine. But the other problem Vietnam has, you know, is that the, their vaccination certificates are not recognised in in a, in a lot of countries. So um, I was checking on the UK. We cannot go back to the UK with a Vietnamese vaccination certificate. And get reduced or exempt from from quarantine. We have to do the the full fourteen days. So uh, yeah. So I mean that's a very good point, Bill. Uh, and at the moment, uh, until the government starts entering into bilateral discussions with other governments, I, I think it's difficult to say. Maybe one other discussion with with Phu Quoc coming up. Would those be snowbirds? You know, here we know we have snowbirds certainly coming to Thailand. They come up, as soon as it starts snowing in northern Europe or eastern Europe. We have these travelers. I know Russia is a popular market for Phu Quoc. Uh, here in Thailand, we had Sputnik, which was approved by the Thai government, allowed. What's the situation for the Russians coming back into uh, into Vietnam or to Phu Quoc specifically? Um, no, I, I think uh, Viet Vietnam's negotiation and agreement with uh, with Russia on Sputnik, um, even to uh, to have it manufactured here. Um, so I don't think there'll be any uh, any issues with um, with the Sputnik vaccine. Great. Okay. Thank David? you. Thank you. Uh, just just one observation. Actually, before you go, Ken, I thought you said something that was really interesting. Tourism is tourism is not sustainable relying on domestic travel only. A lot was made of the domestic travel markets in Vietnam, as it was in Thailand, and it was also proven in Thailand that the domestic market um, cannot sustain it. Hence the importance of Sandbox and, aware, and looking at a way of opening up the country to international travel again. Um, Ken Atkinson, thank you so much for your observations and please stick around. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We all look forward to getting Ken's presentation as well. So again, that's going to come, it's going to be sent to you by Sumi after the event. So as well, I think Sumi's on next. Um, uh, no, actually, actually it's me. Okay, there you go. Okay. Leave you now. <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, and um, I'm delighted to welcome Lin Lei. Lin Lei is the principal and co-founder of Luxperia. Lin, how are you? Hi, David. Hi, everybody. And thank you all for having myself and also for tuning in today. Excellent. It's really good to see you again. Um, I know you're mainly focused on the luxury market. Um, and um, so, you know, how is the state of that market at the moment? I know it's a really troubled um, uh, environment and there's been, you know, it's a series of lockdowns. Even before that was going to be um, quite, di quite difficult. How would you assess the status of the luxury market in Vietnam currently? Well, first of all, um, Luxperia is uh, quite a boutique organization. So we're not a high volume uh, mass market player. And uh, since COVID happened, we have pivoted a number of times uh, looking at different markets and also reestablishing our place and presence within the Vietnamese uh, domestic scene. Uh, I have to say when uh, things eased up and became a little bit um, more flexible for domestic tourists last year, we were very lucky to have established ourselves. And so uh, in terms of the luxury market, it, what, rightly so, the, uh, it was the luxury resorts, particularly those in the um, uh, more private destinations, 
uh, destinational resorts, those were the resorts that sort of bounced back and reopened first. So uh, typically within the cities, occupancy remained low, um, I guess very much like Bangkok as well. Yeah. Uh, but people were moving from the cities, getting out of the, um, the, the density of the urban environment and going into more resorts. So I do see that that bouncing back first and foremost after the current fourth wave that we're going through. Um, so do you, in terms do you, do you of uh, that, my friends in the three-star circles, I also think that they will take a little bit of time. And one of the uh, um, obstacles that the any, uh, resorts and hotels that are three-star and below have is the fact that you know average room rates versus profitability becomes a challenge um, during these times. Okay. Um very interesting what you say about about the way your business has pivoted and i'm sure it's been I'm sure it's been challenging but i'm a, but i'm sure it's been successful too um and it's also interesting to hear about hear about this trend um this tre trend for lower density resorts and environments are there any particular destinations in vietnam that you would like to highlight where you have um, high-end low density <laughs> resorts <laughs> Um, I have to say, look, I can only speak on experience, but from the past 25, past, oh, nearly 24 months, um, I'd dare say that a lot of the uh, island locations perfect, uh, perfectly pitched is Phu Quoc, uh, Condal, um, other destinations. I mean, there has been a lot of development here as well. Like Ken said, there are more and more room keys coming into the Vietnamese um, uh, market as a destination. So what I'm finding is that there are uh, other destinations within Vietnam's long country that allows us to uh, offer um, more of a more more of a destination focused uh, resort stay. Uh, places like Quy Nhon, uh and also um, uh, you know up in the north as well. Okay, uh, thanks. That's that's uh, uh, that's fascinating. Let's get straight to Phu Quoc then. Um, how? Uh, um, I mean, what what what? Keys before you got fifteen thousand um, keys coming up in the pipeline. I mean, that's a that's a that's an extraordinary um, pipeline. It's almost almost doubling of the inventory there. But you know, th that aside, you know, what is required to open up Phu Quoc from your side? You know, what's and and what are going to be the benefits of it? from the luxury sector, of course. Um, in my mind, I see two important things, uh, accessibility and uh, the ease of getting onto the island itself. So uh, conversations need to be had with offering airlines direct access from regional key markets. Um, if uh, currently, and also historically, anyone traveling into Phu Quoc uh, was required to transit via Ho Chi Minh City. And by transiting Ho Chi Minh City, they would have to leave the air side of the international terminal to uh, check in to the domestic side, which is on land side. Now with the current quarantine and uh, regulations, this is, isn't, isn't possible for Phu Quoc. So if there were uh, conversations to be had, it's really important to be able to offer the uh, direct access for flights, uh, particularly with key airlines, um, you know, Vietnam Airlines, uh, Bamboo are going to be pivotal in order for uh, success to happen beyond the vaccination rates that Ken's just mentioned as well. So okay. uh, I think that if we can resolve that, we can have a very efficient and uh, a safe way uh, to, to reopen Phu Quoc as a case study. Okay, if you can't get there well, you can't really stay there, you know, so that's a, so that, that's, that's a really important that's right. point to stay. Um, and and what, what, what sort of markets are we talking about here? Um, are there any particular, uh, I mean, we, we, um, um, Bill was asking um, Ken the story about, uh, Ken about the Russian market, you know, Sputnik was accepted, it was, it, it was low, but, you know, we're looking forward to, there are some forward bookings coming in, you know, December, for example, the forward bookings into, into Phuket are looking quite good through the sandbox. Are there any particular markets that you're looking at? Indy was mentioned also. So um, uh, what, what's the, what's the, what are your views there? Look, the um, Russian market is a traditional market, as well as the Chinese and the uh, South Korean market for Phu Quoc, and also in Vietnam in general. However, I also see that um, as a result of the pandemic, the entire world um, from all markets are reassessing the way that they travel and where they travel as well. Uh, what's key is that um, we also have to consider um, the bilateral agreements of the, um, uh, of countries accepting vaccines, like Ken said. And I also uh, consider the fact that 
um, charters from Eastern Europe uh, are going to be key uh, to, to drive this. And with those early adopters coming back to Fukuoka, I also see that the um, uh, more of the mid-range, um, rather than long-haul flights, the mid-range uh, destinations, I'm talking about Singapore, I'm talking about uh, Hong Kong, uh, potentially Australia as well, that um, Australians are likely to come back probably before UK and US travelers, I think. So those would be your, those would be your top three expected markets, you think? Um, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia? Um, yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. It's great to hear. And what about and what about and what about rates? I mean, is it just going to be a bun fight? Are people going? To, everyone's going to be um, uh, you know, dropping their rates and you know, desperately trying to, um, uh, to 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 attract business. I mean, we've seen a bit of that here in Phuket, but this hasn't 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 been too bad. What I mean, is it going to be a rate driven recovery? I think initially there will be uh, attractive rates, but um, I'm sure very rapidly hotels will gain back their uh, uh, a high average room rate. Um, why? Because I think there's going to be, uh, one, there's a lot of competition. 35,000 room keys uh, is definitely going to drive a rate-driven market. However, uh, given the fact that there are limited destinations for people to choose from, I also see the potential for hoteliers to be increasing those rates because, one, Vietnam was always an affordable destination historically. And so I, I think, do think that it will remain an affordable destination. However, it, it, uh, I don't see um, uh, bargain prices or, or uh, uh, base dollar, uh, you know, zero dollar tours happening. No, it's, re it's really good to hear. We've actually, in Phuket, we've actually seen um, a lot of hotels have not opened. But the hotels that have been bold, they've opened, they've had pretty good rent integrity, and they've, yes. and they've, they've slowly getting their businesses back on track. Um, then later, That's right. I mean, like, like I mentioned, it is the international um, and larger resorts that are reopening because they have the infrastructure and they have the resources. Uh, if they have um, in-house residents for staff, it makes it less, um, uh, uh, it, it, it um, reduces the risk level of um, local transmissions. So it's a case where the Ma and Pa owned hotels, they may stay closed for a little while. However, it will be the international brands that relaunch fastest. Okay, fantastic. Lynn Lay, um, principal and co-founder, Luxperia. Lynn, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Thanks so much. And, uh, Thanks, and, and please stick around. Thank you. Um, right, next up we have um, uh, Lynn Bui, and Lynn Bui is going to be introduced by Sumi, Business Development Director of Delivering Age Communications. Thank you. Sumi, Dave. over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We've got a very special guest today who wears many hats. Uh, so we've got Lynn Bui, who is the Managing Director of Sands Asia Travel, and she's also the Marcoms Director for Baya Group. Welcome to the webinar, um, Lynn Bui. How are you today? Thank you, Sammy. Good. I'm good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy to see like all of you here with smiling face and positive attitude. Thank you. I think that's the way we've got to move forward to, um, especially in this, uh, you know, pandemic times. Um, since you have, you, you wear, uh, you know, many different hats. So I think this will be quite interesting to our audience who are listening. Uh, what do you think? the Vietnam um, tourism is doing in terms of positioning in itself, uh, you know, during the pandemic or, uh, you know, what you will see after the pandemic, how the country will adapt, how fast or how strong it's going to position itself. And as an industry um, person yourself, like, what do you think the support that you would like to see that the uh, relevant authorities can um, do during this time to, to promote the destination? Yes, right. Thanks, Sami. So as the person working in this tourism industry, we think that COVID is collapsed, but it gives us a great chance that for all the individuals and enterprise, a health check and mental check to see like who we are, where we're standing, and how we well prepare for the rough time. So after the last two years, we faced a lot of difficulty. Uh, a lot of our college have, have been like moving, transforming their company into like food selling organization to keep everybody afloat and support their family. Like a lot of successful company actually selling flowers and paintings and everybody is keeping uh, the close contact with their key staff to be ready for the coming back. Uh, 
um, not many companies turn fast enough to adapt with the domestic travel. But like after two years uh, standing at this uh, moment, I think that people is still like hopefully and looking for the comeback. And um, as the as at the moment, I'm also wearing a lot of hats uh, because uh, our group is actually frozen the the tours come uh, the tours uh, things because we don't move fast enough to back to domestic, but we're still up running with the cruise business and hotels. So what we are looking for is uh, we optimistic about the situation in next year hopefully like up, i think beginning of q3 then we will um, be able to open the 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 border but like the same thing we're coming back we need a lot of support from the government to positioning vietnam in the, and promote vietnam to the world uh, what we are we doing after the pandemic we will be like the country of heritage of nature of nature's uh, and experience uh, travel, how we will promote with uh, all the visa things, uh, with new products, uh, with new marketing strategy and posi positioning ourselves in the market. I think it's a big question and need a lot of help from the tourism board to set up our brand in the market. Uh, we need a lot of good products, also like a very clear strategy uh, in opening back to, to get the good impression from all the tourists, because when we open back, I think we need a very stable strategy. The last two years, even we work with the domestic, we have a lot of difficulty because we close and open very regularly. So all the company and hotel, we cannot act fast enough. Like with one case, two case, we have the closing. And then we open too short for one and two months without like, enough time to do any uh, active program to adapt with the client and then we close again. So hopefully like next year when we have a clear strategy, clear support to attract all the tourists coming back, but also like, like we need a very sustainable development plan for all the tour company and hotels to have our strategy ready and not, and we can um, actively planning for our future. Right. Thank you very much. You, yeah, we, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, domestic marketing and preparing for international um, borders to open. So what about um, nature and, um, you know, uh, based uh, adventures? Do you see that growing? And, and would that be something that the domestic market would be uh, taking up as well during this time? Actually, like the, in the last two years, the domestic is not stop traveling, even like we close and open, close and open. But in the same time, the domestic market is grabbing all the chance to travel. So it's good because we see that uh, last year we have quite a lot of new hotels, nature lodge opening. Like we have uh, Papu uh, in Hazang, uh, Xavier in Fuyen, Havana in Mokcho. Topaz Sapa is also expanding, but we still have like clients grabbing all the promotion and voucher to travel to luxury uh, nature lodge and right. it's good and also like the, the domestic uh, people they also like very open like, for camping and outdoor and trekking in the last two years uh, individual family they travel a lot every weekend whenever the the restriction is loosened everybody is, is grabbing their package and drive out to a short distance and uh start experiencing. So I think the, the trending of domestic travel is actually um, positive for, for all of us to see that they are adapting a lot of new things, trying a lot of new things, but still it's because we get a really good rate the last two years. So we we cannot also like predict like how it's been development if the market back to normal and we have both inbound and domestic at the same time with a new rate ratio then uh, it's also like a question for us to develop our strategy and forecast for the domestic. But I think it is good because like, like for example, Osalik, the last two years they receive a lot of local and a lot of people go for Sundong, go for uh, cave exploring, like really hardcore. And like before we are queuing up because we fully, they fully booked with the inbound market, but now it's open for domestic with good price. So everybody jump in. I think it's a really good sign about the, yeah. 
So do you see there's a change in destination, like resorts versus um, urban um, destinations for these travelers? Definitely. I think it's also because of COVID, so people is try to stay away from the crowd area. Um, it's, it's new with Vietnamese because, you know, we all fight with mass tourism to the common beach or destination like Dalat, for example. But now more and more people looking for nature lodge even like independent camping, go to into the jungle, find new destination and set their own personal camp. So um, yes, people are like moving out more to the urban and nature surrounded destination. Okay, great. I've got one last question before we wrap up this session with you. Um, so given the current global uh, market situation uh, and issues, so which other markets do you see who are actively talking to Vietnamese uh, mm. agents at the moment. So as you know, I am um, Sense Asia Travel is also belong to the group holding of AG, um, AG Group. So we have um, cruise business, e-commerce uh, for uh, booking, like GoTaddy for Vietnamese. Uh, we also have DMC and also B2C. So at the last 12 years, actually the first year, everybody is still positive and making planning for for 2021, but then uh, at the moment, I think the most actively uh, partners we are working with is actually European. It's a little bit different than uh, Mr. Lingle share, but at the moment, um, US, UK, Switzerland, and German are the main market that really active in requesting new product, also planning new pricing, right. and uh, and they are really active uh, working with us on ideas and things. Even like we cannot provide the, the new rate yet because like our partner is still closing. But uh, there are good sign for US and Canada is also pretty and tourism. It's a feel that because we have a lot of pending booking, no one yeah. cancel. So everybody wants to move ahead. And US and Canada group, they, they really end tourism to one they want right. to travel in February next year already. Yes. So I think as soon as we have the, the side of opening border, yeah. we can see like I think that people are ready to come back uh, okay. and it's good. I think the, the a little bit quiet is actually Australia. I don't know be, because I think the situation may be still some case locked down and things a little bit uh, not sustainable at the moment. But uh, okay. Australian account is a little bit quiet for us, but uh, active for Mr. Lingle for luxury uh, area, for luxury example, bread. I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, but we, we feel we feel great working, keep in contact with our partners and ready for next year. Thank you. Excellent. I love that positivity and enthusiasm <laughs> in your delivery. Thank you very much, Lim Bui, Managing Director Thank of Sands Asia Travel and Mark Holmes, Director for Bayer Group. Thank you for being with us today. David. Thanks, Sumi. <laughs> Excellent. Good stuff. Um, right. Next, we have um, uh, Jai Kishan. And uh, Jai Kishan is general manager of, uh, of New World Fuquoc Resort. So it's the man on the ground. Bill, over to you, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just get out of here. Okay. Fuquoc, here we are in Fuquoc. <laughs> okay, Jai's, Jai's got the enviable position of being a hotel manager in a pandemic. Oh, Jesus, what a shitstorm that is, right? <laughs> I don't know. How's that going? Jai, first question up. How are hotels having a talk with the government on the sandbox? It's interesting. We understand what happened here in terms of it was kind of unique in Phuket because there was a unique partnership. Traditionally, the private and the public sector have a complete disconnect. But amazingly enough, during the sandbox, we had a great level of communication. It was kind of inspiring to see these guys working together. How's it going there in Phuket? Uh, good day all, Bill, and the team and the panelists and whoever is listening to this conversation. It's great to see you all. And in regards to the first question, how am I doing? I'm doing fabulously well because this is my calling. This is what we do. We go through the challenges and we get through them smiling and happy with positivity, spreading across the community and entire network of the stakeholders. Coming back to the second point of the question, which is about the government initiatives and what we are doing. We are owned by the Sun Hospitality Group and that gives us a tremendous opportunity to influence the government and get to the decisions which matter on the ground to make it happen. For example, we do have a network of four hotels here and an entire ecosystem, which includes the wellness and all the hospitality paraphernalia 
to make sure that every guest who comes in is safe and secure and has the value in delivery. And what we have done since the pandemic broke somewhere early July is we have started working with the government. We are testing not only our own team members, but the citizens and the community as well. Plus we have got the vaccinations secured, procured, and we have vaccinated close to 2000 people in our community. And we are going to do the same for another 20,000 odd people, which is going to start from this weekend onwards. And that is going to ramp up. In that way, we are doing all we can to ensure the prime safety and security of the people on the island. And then we will move it forward to the guests who are coming in. In regards to the third point as to what and how we are getting the guests onto the island, we are working in similar lines of the Phuket sandbox and the travel bubbles between few of the countries which have come up. We have designed the vaccine passport as well. And we had few negotiations with the government and with all the stakeholders involved. And we have fine-tuned that program to ensure that the policies and the procedures are clear. And going back to what Ken and Lin and uh, Lin Bui has said, the clarity is the most important aspect in this. And once we, along with the infrastructure, which includes the hospitals, which includes the port, which includes the cruise terminal, because these are the three ways to get onto the island, we are also working along with them, plus the community to ensure that we are ticking all the boxes crossing all the T's to ensure that we give the confidence for a visitor from either Europe or Australia or from ASPAC to make sure that they travel here and then they do get more than what they expected. Sure, sure, I understood. I know you brought up a real good point about the community and something we found here in Phuket was uh, the, you know, you have to gauge community reaction. There's a fear factor with the community about having, uh, having travelers come back into that. And it's great to see you having vaccination drives there. But within the hotel premises, do you have a regime of testing or how, what's changed in the hotel since the pandemic started or, or going into the sandbox experiment that you expect to implement, which is different than you normally would? Yeah, our hotel itself is located on the southern tip of the Fukok. And we have our own private stretch of the beach, 3.5 kilometers. And it's secluded, it's pristine, it's clean, and it's got a good mix of sun, sand, and surf. And in regards to the resort itself, we are spread across 60 hectares. So it's a massive resort. And just the point is we do have around 7,000 coconut trees and lots of greenery around. And so going back to Lynn's point, we are probably the best and the finest hotel, which is brand new, which has got a low density, but high value offering with a luxury service for every guest who walks in. So the resort itself, we divided into four zones because of the way the resort is structured. And we are a three bedroom and a four bedroom all villa pool resort. We do have 375 of them. So in that way, there is enough for every guest to have their own privacy, which gives them the additional assurance of the security. And we opened the resort on 30th May. So we are a brand new resort. In that way, okay. our infrastructure is as new as it can get. And then during the pandemic in 5th of July, we shut it down. We suspended operations. We did have a few long stay guests who continued to stay. In that way, there is a positive momentum for the team who stayed on. Our ownership has been incredibly good to us. They supported us in all initiatives which we took. Once we knew that the pandemic was coming and we're going to reopen the hotel, with the ownership and with the Rosewood Hotel Group, we also participated in few innovative programs, including technology, which we call it the touchless service. So we have redesigned the whole check-in arrival process, the dining emphasis, and then the recreation, and then the rejuvenation, and then the wellness part as well. Sure. We designed an exclusive wellness package, which caters to all the family segments, and the market segments as well. We calling ourselves as the best family resort on the island. So we have got right from under 12 teenagers, 12 to 18, sure. and then afterwards the young adults and then the couples and then the grandmothers. And then we go across the board with third generation and two generations. So in that way, we redesigned the program for guest arrival, guest interaction, 
and guest safety and security right from the point of the reservation to the point of checkout. Okay, maybe going back to the question also is, what about your staff? Do you, you know, yeah. with your staff, when you have travelers coming in, are you doing testing with staff again? Are you doing uh, uh, antigen testing? And I think something we've learned here is you're not gonna eliminate COVID. You know, you're still gonna have COVID cases. So what's Correct. your scenarios there? How are you testing your staff or how are you operating the back of the house? Okay, uh, we do have 234 fine ladies and gentlemen with us, and they were all here right from the day one with us. So in that way, the attrition has been very low. The simple reason because the owners and the brand have done their best to ensure everybody's safety. And one of the ways we ensured the safety is we were probably one of the first hotels to ensure that we do have the PPE kit and the testing kits and the entire infrastructure, including a medical clinic on the resort to ensure that if there is any positive case or if there is even a suspect or an asthmatic right. case, we do take care of them. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Last week, we tested our entire 234 team members and luckily none of them came positive. So we are all negative in that way. So, and then that continues because the good thing about Fukok and our ownership is we do have a residential employee unit, which we call the Sun Home. So all the employees do move from Sun Home to the resort in a bus, which is quarantined. And as per the local government protocols, which is the 5K principle, which includes the face mask, disinfectant, social distancing, we ensure that these things are followed to the T and we do test weekly and whenever there is a necessity. Right. So in that okay. way, all the team members are stressed out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I've got one final question. We're almost out of time here, but Please. budget budget 2022. How the hell do you do a budget right now in this in this pandemic? You know, does the budget have any meaning? Again, a hotel management company as well. What are yeah. your views on towards of making a budget for 2022 for your owners, but also for your corporate office? How do you go about that? What's the rationale? Okay, the, the rationale for preparing a budget in the old school format is to please the banks and the stakeholders. But now considering the COVID and considering it's lasting impact for the last two years, I think a rolling forecast would be the best bet. And a rolling forecast would be the way to go because none of us could have predicted that this is going to happen. And the situation changes so rapidly that you can never get a hand of it. With our technology systems, which we have, either Ideas or RevMax or any of that stuff, right. they actually don't know what's happening. They don't have enough data to actually come to us. So I would say the common sense will prevail. And then smart marketing strategies, which is social websites and market segments, and then the, your interactions, and then your ownership bandwidth, and then your brand bandwidth would be the key to ensure that your success is the business. So in a summary, nobody knows what's going to happen, but we are eternally optimistic. We have the technology, we have the experience and the education to ensure that every opportunity is maximized. So in that way, it's everybody's guess, but we do our best to win it every single time. Okay, okay we heard it from Chai, everybody's guess. You know, we've got the same thing, rolling forecast makes the absolute sense unless you want a business plan gathering desks, everything. What we know is what we don't know right now. Jai, thank you so much again. Great insight. And we look forward to coming to Fuquak when it's open again and visiting you there. Uh, David Johnson, who's up next? Thanks very much, Bill. Um, and thank you, Jai. That was really, really superb. Um, we have uh, Seif Hamdi. Seif is the general manager of the Intercontinental Da Nang Sun Peninsula Resort. Seif, how are you? Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank really you. good to see you. Splendid chair you've got there, by the way. I just had to mention that. <laughs> Better than my background, uh, for sure. It goes back to Bill Bensley, you know. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bensley, okay. He always, he always uh, creeps in somewhere. Um, yeah. We've talked a lot about um, our other destinations. We've talked about nature. We've talked about luxury market. We've talked about food quark. Um, how about Da Nang? Let's just talk a little bit about Da Nang. Um, how is Da Nang at the moment? Well, um, Da Nang is the same like other destination. And please allow me in the beginning to really uh, appreciate and thank the local community across Vietnam for the level of respect and commitment to follow all the government direction. Because that allow us to take certain decisions and put certain restrictions that ensured our safety. And this is something phenomenal. So please allow me to start with that. Uh, the Nang City, uh, as we may know, it's open and closed based on the, uh, the cases and the situation we see here. And uh, our hotel is the same, open and closed at the same time. We all have experienced um, certain challenges like uh, staff motivation, staff engagement, retention, 
And we had to work very smart to make sure we retain them, train them, and get them ready for post-pandemic. Uh, and I'm confident that the NAG um, is learning, is watching, and we're going to overcome uh, those tough times. Thank you. Um, there's, there's, been a lot, there's been a lot of talk about the domestic market. Um, I, I'd just, just like to ask you a little bit. Have you seen, I know, I know um, cur currently your hotel's closed, um, but how, have you, how did you find the domestic market before you closed um, in terms of the dynamics? Was it changing? Was it looking for um, different types of experiences? Was it looking for a more nature-based experience? Um, yeah. you know, I, know you're, I know you're very focused on design. I know you're, I know you're in, a, in, a, in a very low density, um, low density um, a resort in a low density area. Um, how, how did you find this market changing? Well, we're all expecting that change in the market. Is it domestic or original? The behaviors is also changing. The good thing is we're relying on domestic business uh, and we are very fortunate that we are very popular among the local community and the Vietnamese. And one of the major changes, they're looking very well into the dining experience. They want to eat healthy. They want very well balanced meal that possibly outdoor, if, if they can, they need to have their privacy. And we've seen a lot happening toward the wellness. Everyone needs to have a vacation to rejuvenate, to really regain energy and get back to the usual life when they leave the property. Um, we, we planned a lot of activity around that to make sure we look after them when they're here at the property. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I, I can't believe it. It's taken us 45 minutes to talk about food. Um, I think that's incredible. Um, well done, guys, because um, it's obviously a key driver. It's a key domestic driver, too. People need to eat. People love to eat, too. Um, let's just talk a little bit about some of the challenges that, you, that you've experienced. I, I think it's going to be really valuable um, to talk about the hospitality challenges um, as a hotelier um, um, during COVID. I mean, how have you managed, have you managed staff? Have you managed health and safety? What sort of protocols have you put in place? This will obviously, I, I know um, uh, uh, Jai was talking about this a little bit before too, but I'd be really interested in your experience. Yeah, no, since, since the, uh, the pandemic raised up, we started to learn from our own actions and our own mistakes. We have done some mistakes and we started to correct those mistakes. Our number one priority, priority really was with our team, the entire ladies and gentlemen at the property. So we thought of them, what are we going to do? First, we need to retain them. So we keep everyone employed and we have a supporting uh, owning company that helps us with that. When we keep our people here at the property, what are we going to do? We have to train them. And we selected the best training companies to collaborate together and use the evolve of technology to deliver the message. So that was one of our major challenges. Then the hotel is, our hotel is very sensitive resort. If you don't look after it, things change. And here, the maintenance and uh, taking care of the condition of the property being at one of our highest priority as well. So we looked after the property to make sure that we are ready to welcome the guests when they come in the best possible way. Uh, I think that these were some of our major uh, challenges. Then obviously motivating the team uh, was, was a challenging. And then here we came together as, as ex comet we did the entire team together. What can we do? And simple things really, playing football together, volleyball together, uh, making a reading book club, uh, you know, enrolling in certain courses online. And IG is very rich with Harvard Business Reviews uh, uh, courses that we work with, yeah. Forbes standard uh, competition um, among the team. So it was, it was we, we were able to overcome with that. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Can we look forward to a Da Nang sandbox in the future? Well, it's, uh, I, it's great news. And uh, I really want... Uh, everyone to start to talk about the positive notes because this industry is phenomenal and, it will, and we will overcome all these challenges. Now, the Vietnamese government, we all know they're very cautious. We're watching what's happening in Phuket and how they adopt and how they turn things around to see, uh, um, to face the challenges they face. And now we talked about Phuk Walk and then I will be watching and seeing what's happening with Phuk Walk and we look forward to, uh, to the sandbox opening and football then followed by the name. The real thing here that I really want to mention, David, is are we ready to welcome the travelers? Are we taking care of our hotels and resorts? Uh, are we really taking care of our people that are working with us? Are we training them? Because the guests, when they come, they come with great expectation and we don't want to let them down. Is it domestically, originally, or internationally? No, that's right. That's, that's actually a really good point because, um, because you know, in, in, in Phuket, for example, the staff 
um, there's been people either either furloughed or or, diff, or different. I mean, the, the staff counts are down, and motivation can be down too. So service can drop as a result. So it's really good to um, uh, um, to focus on that point. Um, uh, just a couple of other quick things. Um, Hotels and public sector, it's so important. And like, like, uh, like, like Bill Barnett was saying earlier, um, you know, the public sector and the private sector in Phuket really didn't work, to get, work together so well. But it's been very functional and it's been absolutely key to getting Phuket Sandbox off the ground. Um, what is your view on that in uh, well, Vietnam? In, in, in Vietnam, to be very honest, uh, we had several meetings, internal meeting with the general managers in, in Da Nang City. Uh, virtually, we have discussed what needs to be done. We had meetings with chosen board, we had information, and there are a lot of communication channels uh, channels that we've been involved as well to, to deliver the message or hear an update and see what is happening. And um, I, I believe all of us need to take a proactive approach to make sure we support the country because this is something we're dealing with unusual circumstances. There is no experts here. And I think what really matters is, is the commitment. We need 110% commitment to overcome that situation and, and bring back the tourism uh, to its original, which will happen. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Well, we certainly hope that the, that the, um, uh, that the Food Quark Sandbox goes ahead and it's successful and it leads to perhaps other destinations. That's, that's part of the, um, uh, the proof of concept that's going through at the moment in, um, in Phuket. Right, um, back to Phuket, lessons from the sandbox. I'm gonna welcome Bill Barnett back and then please stick around everyone because there's gonna be some questions. We're gonna but, but hang on, but Steve Hamdi, that was fabulous. Thank you so much, please stay around. My pleasure. Great furniture in Phuket. There's some great furniture actually in the hang. I mean, you guys are great there, it's well done. We're going to come back. We have lots of questions and coming up. You're going to come back for that. Let's learn again. Let's talk about the journey forward. We've got this road here. It's kind of a windy road in the back. There's a high tension power line. We've got to worry about it being electrocuted. What are our lessons from the Phuket sandbox for Vietnam? Okay. Lesson one is the private public sector partnership. I think that's critical. That's something we've seen and something we understood very clearly is Phuket is still part of Thailand. It's called the Phuket Sandbox, but as the regulations for 14 days quarantine is that Phuket couldn't make up its own rules. It has to work against a national legislation and there's 14 days. It worked within those 14 days. It worked within the system and that's been the answer to getting it going in travel, okay? Number two is that it's a restart of travel and travel is good for hotels, be they resort hotels or whatever else. So bringing people back in the country, you're gonna see not only tourists come back, you're going to have returning Vietnamese. You're going to have people who work in Vietnam who want to come back, and this is the best way to get back into the country. You're going to have people who want to have business meetings, perhaps, and they're going to meet their Vietnamese counterparts in Phu Quoc or other places. So it allows business to restart. And by a certain number of days, you have to stay in hotels. It generates, tour it generates income. This is important, okay? But it's travel. It's not necessarily just about tourism, and that's really the key because that's what starts everything. We know we have to learn to live. Number three is we know we have to learn to live with COVID, okay? Otherwise, we're gonna be stuck in New Zealand for the rest of our lives, okay? You know, those guys aren't gonna go anywhere for a very long time. We have to be able to have people have to travel again. I go back in our lifetime, the only thing we've seen like it is 9-11. Some countries for 10, 20 years, they were still taking their shoes off at airports, but they were getting on airplanes and traveling and travel boomed as well, okay? And maybe the final thing we understand is when people say, is travel going to come back? Thailand, where I sit, and Vietnam are very close together, and these countries sit within six to eight hours of a third of the world's population. And you think people don't want to travel. What we've seen here is people want to come back. The early travelers are families reuniting, their friends getting together again, and these are the first travels. It's not just about holidays. It's about reuniting people, and I think that's so very important about the, the sandbox. It's about that connection again to our families and our friends, and that's the starting point of travel again, not just a vacation. So I think those are points from the sandbox. David, we've got some Q&A coming up, right? Yeah, we've got absolutely, thank you, Bill. Okay, I'm gonna give you that. Okay. Thanks, we've got, yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got stacks of questions. We're just gonna get through as many of them as, as we can. And there's, and there's a theme um, uh, coming through here. Hey, in, um, uh, for Phuket Sandbox, we uh, looked at you know, positioning and, and um, one campaign that came out of Phuket Sandbox was the Welcome Back Home campaign that really focused on the local people in Phuket. It really came through that way. And there were some, some questions about, about positioning. In fact, there's been a number of questions about positioning here. And this one's going to be for, 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 for Lin Lei. Um, how do we position? How would you say you position Vietnam? What should you look at? You know, what is going to be the key draw? Something that's really succinct and clear for your market. Lin. 
That's a great question. Um, first of all, I think we need to look at the success that Vietnam has had so far in terms of not winning from COVID, but controlling the, in the, the situation. Um, throughout 2020, Vietnam was, uh, was, was winning that case in terms of controlling numbers. And even, I dare say now, so um, Vietnam is doing well. Why is it doing so well? It's simply because there are rules set in place. People are listening to the rules. They're protecting themselves and they're also protecting their neighbours. So I think the positive message about uh, that needs to go out on a global level in order to attract more visitors to Vietnam. And uh, anything along the lines of our success rate, uh, the welcoming and the fighting spirit of the Vietnamese. Okay, that sounds, that sounds fantastic. So that's, that's focusing on people again. It, sound, it sound, sounds great. There's maybe a theme emerging here. Um, um, there's also been a lot of questions about hotels, actually from hoteliers, you know, what to do. Um, so I'm, go I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask you guys, um, Jai, I know you touched on it a little bit, but, but one, two, three, the top three things that you should do. How can a hotel prepare? How okay. can you be ready? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing would be getting the community to be part of your team. It's not just the hotel team. The second is working with the public sector as well, which includes the government, the transportation, and then the logistic companies. And the third thing is continuously try to evolve, adapt, stay positive, and ensure that no man is left behind. So that would be the three goals. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Wrapped up very nicely. Thank you so much. Ken, we've got one for you here. Hey, um, uh, the, the, in the Phuket, Phuket has one thing that's really struggled with, and I think Bill touched on it a little bit, was the domestic versus international. Sandbox opens, domestic, um, uh, uh, domestic out, international in because there's still uh, vaccination levels low still in Thailand for a, uh, in, in, in Bangkok and outside of Phuket for, 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 a, for, a, for a long for a long period of time it's got a lot better how is how is how could Phu Quoc manage that in terms of the domestic versus the international should they cut off the domestic market well there was Certainly in the earlier discussions that I had with uh, some of the, the, the key stakeholders and particularly uh, hotel owners, uh, they were concerned that uh, the borders reopened, that uh, the domestic market would, such as it was, would, would, would fall away. Um, other discussions I've heard are around, uh, and, and um, I think some of the other uh, people on the panel will, will maybe know more than me on that, but is around whether you know, we open part of the island and restrict it to foreigners uh, and open another, you know, open the rest of the island um, for, for the local, for the local travelers. Um, that, yeah, I mean, that, that, that certainly got uh, um, some plus points to it, but, um, you know, how do you, how do you decide the, um, the key, the key area for, for generating revenue is, it's more likely to be around the casino um, and 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 the bill bin pill um, facilities. Um, right. So and locals and foreigners will, will want to take take advantage of that. Ken, thank you very much. You very See, much. this is one for you. Um, it's relating to oh, it's relating to investment actually. Um, there's been a lot of trends that have come that's come out of COVID that they're, they're important for hotels to recognize. You know, there's, there's, there's wellness trends, there's nature trends, there's, um, there's, there's more outdoors trends, and there's technology trends. How can hotels keep up with that? How can they welcome back the, um, having been either closed or having been, um, you know, operating on a 10% occupancy? Um, how, can they, how, can they, how can they manage that? How can they invest in their, in their products and be really ready? Well, um, for me, really, I would keep it simple. One is make sure your team is very motivated, well-trained, and having a beautiful smile to welcome all the guests from all over the region. Number two, we all know across our career that the level of the cleanliness is critical, but nowadays is extremely important. And IG help us greatly uh, with IG Clean Promise, and we collaborate with great partners who help us to clean better day by day. I think the level of the cleanliness does not, does not cost us much. Number three, uh, just make sure that your asset is well maintained and, and taken care of. There is no client wants to come and see deteriorated asset. They, they will not come back. Just, just, just three little things. 
I believe would help us greatly. Then the rest will follow one step at a time. There is a long way ahead of us. Okay, exactly. Um, that's fantastic. Um, then, Bui, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Um, um, I know what your idea on, on positioning of Vietnam is. I think it's fantastic in terms of more adventure and more, and more, and more nature. So that would be great. Yeah, but, I'm um, but, uh, but, but I'm afraid I'm, 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 gonna... I'm here for the sandbox. Been... Tell me, where's the sandbox? <laughs> Is that about it? That's that's about it. Good luck in that, Bill. Um, (laughs) Guys, thank you. Guys of Vietnam, good luck on the sandbox and safe travels because we're going to be back soon. So, okay. Thank you very much for being positive about Vietnam. And we believe you guys are going to be back the next big market to open in Asia. So, congratulations on that. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thank you, everyone. Bye.